So let's take a look at this problem. First word, argon enters a nozzle. What's argon? You have to know a little bit about argon. It's an ideal gas, but it's a very, very special type of ideal gas. How does it float around in the world? How does nitrogen float around in the world? Nitrogen floats around as N2. How does carbon dioxide float around in the world? CO2. How does argon float around in the world? Does it float around as AR2? Nope, it floats around as AR. There's a very big difference between argon, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide. Can you see the pattern? What's the pattern? Single molecule. It's monoatomic versus diatomic versus, if you want to call it triatomic or whatever, but it's more complex molecule, okay? When you understand how energy is stored in a molecule, you can take your hands and you can go like this. Translation, translation, right? Moving your fist back and forth. That's one way energy on a molecular level is realized in the gas. The other is vibration. Take two hands back and forth. Vibration. Got it? But you got to get two or more to have vibration. And then the next is tumbling, rotation. Well, a single doesn't have a whole lot of energy stored in rotation, but something like nitrogen and carbon dioxide, it's a larger molecule. It can tumble. So those three modes of energy realized at a molecular level, translation, vibration, rotation, help describe why simple gases like monoatomics have constant specific heats. They don't change with temperature. But diatomics and then more complicated gas molecules, their specific heats are stronger functions of temperature. Hence, when it gets higher temperature, more energy can be stored not just in translation, but it can be stored in vibrational mode or rotational mode of the molecule. So when you see argon, you say, ah, monoatomic, constant specific heats. I cannot find, even if I wanted to, a very high accuracy argon table. It doesn't exist. Flip through the book all you want. You won't find an argon table. Can I find argon specific heat at 900 Kelvin? I think it's going to be different than at 300 Kelvin. It's not. You're not going to find a table where it's reported because it's monoatomic and it's just a constant value. Now, this book makes it a little even harder for you because if you want to find properties of argon, you have to really, really know where it's at. If you have your appendix, table A21. All right. So this is table A21. Embedded in here is the specific heat for argon. Where? You have to really know where. Okay? So you say, okay, I see the gas column, CO, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. Monoatomic gases with the, sub, with the footnote A. For monoatomic gases such as helium, neon, argon. There, finally is argon. See that? It's embedded way down here. You have to know where to look. There's argon. Now look at, this is the analytic expression for C sub P bar divided by R bar. What's the bar over those mean? Average? Some textbooks, some things, a bar over top, like X bar is average. But this is not the case in this class. What does the bar over mean? It's on a molar basis. So it's not something per kilogram on a mass basis. It's something per kilomole on a molar basis. True? All right, so um, it's alpha plus beta t plus gamma t squared, delta t cubed, and epsilon t to the fourth. It's a polynomial function of temperature, and they curve fit, and they tell you this is alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, true, in these columns. Notice, this curve fit is a polynomial. Usually polynomial curve fits are pretty wild. And once you get outside of the range in which you curve fit, it really goes shooting up and down. So the range is 300 to 1,000 Kelvin. Should I extrapolate? Can I use this equation if I want to go to 1,200? Then do it, plot it, and you'll convince yourself. Polynomials really vast, wildly oscillate, OK? So don't use it outside the range of interest. But look at down here for the monatomic gases. What's the value of beta? 
gamma, delta, epsilon, zero, zero, zero. Only one, alpha. So it's not a function of temperature. It's a constant over the whole range of temperature. So the value for argons, C sub P bar over R bar is two and a half, 2.5 or five halves. Make sense? That's how you get it. Let's jump back to our problem. So argon enters a nozzle operating at steady state. Nozzle, typically, it's uh, making the cross-sectional area reduce in the direction of flow so it speeds up. So it comes in at state one and goes out at state two. Um, it comes in, it's operating at steady state, and it comes in at a temperature of 1350 Kelvin, 410 kilopascal, so uh, T1 and a P1, and it goes out at, oops, a velocity went in of 20 meters per second, and that exits at T2 of 1160 Kelvin, and a temperature T, a pressure P2, sorry, of 220 kilopascal. Half the time the problem is organizing the information. Determine the velocity at the exit. So find V2, velocity at the exit. Uh, what units do you think I want it in? Meters per second. The next one is what is the rate of exergy destruction? So find E dot D. Oh, but look at the units. It's kilojoules per kilogram. So are they wanting me to calculate E dot D or E dot D divided by M dot, which is the rate of exergy destruction per rate of mass flow through the system? Which one are they asking me to calculate? That one, yeah. E dot D divided by M dot. This has the units of kilojoules per kilogram, true? Make sense? Okay, so for part A, how am I going to calculate that exit velocity? What's the approach? In a First law, energy balance for control volume that goes like that. All right. So for that control volume, uh, let me dispense with a lot of steps through it. Hopefully you've done this enough times. If not, you need to do it enough times. But basically the enthalpy coming in plus the kinetic energy coming in is equal to the enthalpy going out plus the kinetic energy going out. True or false? It's steady state. There's no work. There's no heat transfer. There's no changes in potential energy. That's what the first law boils down to. Can I uh, look? I, I know V1, do I not? And the change in H, because it's argon, I'm going to relate it to a C sub P delta T, a change in temperature. So I'll rearrange this equation. So I'll have V2 is equal to V1 squared plus 2 times h1 minus h2 square root. Did I do the algebra right? Thumbs up if you agree. The algebra look good? Let's go ahead and substitute numbers. So we have 20 meters per second squared plus 2. Ooh, I forgot to talk about uh, the change in h is a C sub p delta t. So I'm going to put here uh, the specific heat constant pressure and then T1 minus T2. I forgot that little substitution, okay? So now I need the specific heat constant pressure. We go back up to our table. What did I say? A21, and we see that C sub P bar divided by R bar is a 2.5. Uh, True? But I need C sub P. Well, let me ask you this. Is C sub P bar equal to 2.5 R bar. Yeah. Okay. What are the units on C sub P bar? What are the units on R bar? They're the same units. Two and a half is dimensionless. So it's kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. Aren't those the units on both the right-hand side, left-hand side? But I want to get to C sub P. So if I multiply by kilomole per kilogram, Will that convert it to kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin? So I, I, I want to divide by the molar mass, divide by the molar mass. Isn't this C sub P? So C sub P is equal to 2.5 times 
8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin, that's our bar, divided by 39.94 kilograms per kilomole, which is the molar mass of argon. So the kilomoles cancel, you're left with the right units of whatever that C sub P is. So put that value of C sub P in right there. And now I have a two temperatures. I'll have the 1350 minus the 1160, that's Kelvin. Okay, I want to focus a little bit on units because I want to add these two and then I want to take the square root, right? But look at the units on V squared. It's meters per second squared, true? Uh, but this one is going to have kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. I can see how the Kelvins go. So what we're going to do here is we're going to put in a unit conversion. What is the unit conversion that I want to put in to help these units work? What units do I want over here for V2? Meters per second. So, so let's convert this 2 C sub P delta T into meters squared per second squared. Add it to the other meters squared per second squared. Take the square root, I'm back to meters per second. So what unit conversion do I want? 1,000, that's exactly right. So 1,000 meters squared per second squared is precisely one kilojoule per kilogram. V2 is uh, 445.1 meters per second. What about the rate of exergy destruction? How do I find that? How do I find the rate of exergy destruction? Hopefully I'll fit it in that box. Okay, how am I going to do that? Is there any exergy destroyed in this here uh, nozzle? If, if, if there are irreversibilities, there will be. So how do I calculate the rate of exergy destruction? Exergy balance. So if we go with an exergy balance, we'll have an equation like this for an open system. Something about uh, the rate of exergy destruction is equal to the mass transfer through it, and then you have the flow exergy coming in. It's higher than the flow exergy going out. And because it's, there's a difference in the flow exergies, you get exergy destruction. I know I'm saving space here, but does that, that's the result of the exergy balance equation. Is there any exergy transfer with work? There would be if there were work, but that's a nozzle. There's no work. Is there any exergy transfer with heat transfer? There would be, but this is a nozzle. It's well insulated, or you would assume it's well insulated. It doesn't explicitly say it, but the purpose of the nozzle is not to transfer heat. And so I would say it's well insulated. It's definitely in this energy balance we have the assumption it's well insulated. Okay, so we have the what we're looking to solve for in terms of the change in the flow exergy, that's H1 minus H2 minus T naught S1 minus S2. True or false? Uh, I left off one thing. What did I leave off? I have an error there. I'm going to stop and I want you to find my error. Oh, don't call it out. I want other people to find it as well. All right, so what did I leave off? Plus Ke1 minus Ke2, the kinetic energy component. Don't forget the kinetic energy component, true? Let me ask this question. I asked it of somebody else. This term and that term, where did this equation come from? First law, rearrange this equation. What does it look like? It'll show that this cancels with that. Now, you don't need to cancel it. You can do it the long way or a longer way. It's not that much longer. It's not that much extra work. But anyway, you get this that it just boils down to T naught times S2 minus S1. And yes, I did switch the order of 1 and 2 because S2 is going to be larger than S1. If there are irreversibilities, the outgoing entropy is going to be greater. You know, if you go back to a second law, you find that S2 minus S1 is simply sigma dot divided by m dot. It's just 
the rate of entropy production per unit mass flow through it. And then, so the, the exergy destruction, you can do this for every problem, but here we're just doing it for the nozzle. You could clearly show the exergy destruction is equal to or proportional to the, the rate of entropy production. So, okay, so let's just solve it this way. What's T naught? Oh, 298 Kelvin. And then S2 minus S1. Hmm. C sub P, natural log of T2 divided by T1, minus R natural log P2 over P1. You have to no negotiate or navigate all these equations. Oh, yeah, it's an ideal gas. Yes, constant specific heat. Yes, I have an analytic expression for the change in entropy. Uh, this one turns out to be around uh, 15.1 kilojoules per kilogram. That's the exergy destruction per unit mass flow through the system for that problem. Any comments or questions? Did you follow that? Why did it take so long for me to solve that one problem? Ready to press forward? I am. <laughs>